Hi and welcome to Boston Media Theory. I'm Marcus Breen. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. This is a program where we talk about a number of things to do with media, communication, and we talk to people who are involved in the field of media and communication in all sorts of ways. Academics, researchers, consultants, activists, and indeed people who are in engaged, if you like, in social movements, acts of resistance, as we might say, uh, to draw attention to concerns of the day that may not get the kind of coverage that they deserve. So having said that, I'm, well, I'm delighted to welcome tonight Duncan McFarland from the US-China People's Friendship Association. Thank you, Marcus. Really glad to be here. Great, great to see you and thanks for being here. I should add that you're from the New England chapter, or I think that's what it's called. That's yeah, what... it's a national organization, so um... Uh, I'm, uh, you know, representing the New England chapter, not the national. Excellent. Group. Okay. All right. Well, here we are. We're broadcasting this in New TV in Newton, Massachusetts, which is definitely New England. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I wanted to talk to you about the association, which we can call the USCPFA, okay. if you like, and use it as a way of explaining these questions or the questions that emerge about friendship and the international relations situation uh -huh. between China and the United States. But let's start with the USCPFA, the US-China People's Friendship Association. Right. Uh, what is it? Let's, let's go right back to basics and, and can you tell us what it is? A little well, bit about its history maybe. Yeah, sure. It's a nonprofit educational association. Um, it's a national organization, there are a couple of dozen chapters, and uh, it was founded nationally, I believe, in 1973, right. after the big opening, uh, uh, you know, when Nixon and Kissinger went to China oh. and so forth, and, yeah. um, and there was a big opening toward China, there was a huge rush of interest in the United States of wanting to connect with China in different ways. Yeah. Um, culturally, education, business, uh, all kinds of um, people are interested in sort of reconnecting with China since um, those connections have been broken off really in 1949, 1950, around and then. And so the association was founded as a people-to-people -people organization. Um, so it's not, you know, it's a non-governmental organization mm -hmm. and uh, we think there's a lot of value in people's diplomacy, so to speak. Oh, okay. And um, in the 1970s and 1980s, very active and, and first promoting normalization of U.S.-China relations, which was accomplished in 1979. And then in the 1980s, um, sponsored many exchanges, educational programs, and um, also did a lot of work uh, hosting and, um, Chinese scholars who mm. came to the Boston area and many other places mm. um, didn't know much about the U.S. Um, and so helping them with their day-to-day -day lives and so forth. So those are the kind of um, uh, activities that, um, that we did back in the 70s and 80s. I've been a member since 1976. Recent times, however, with the um, downturn in official relations, mm -hmm. um, the need for people-to-people -people relations, in my opinion, has grown greater. Right. Yes. And, and one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is the quite frequent references from Chinese people, from Chinese diplomats in particular, but also students that I know and other people about this idea of people-to-people, -people, the importance of people seeing China and meeting Chinese people. It's, it's an interesting and fairly unique kind of pitch to make <laughs> in some ways, isn't it? Well, it is. And um, these days, the mainstream U.S. media gives a very one-sided picture of China, mm. in my opinion, emphasizing the negative, um, not saying much about the positive. Um, but um, when people, um, U.S. people and Chinese people actually connect, you know, personally or, mm. or even over Zoom, um, uh, it's a very educational experience. Often when people go to China and, and tours are picking up again, they, they have, they see something very different than they expected. 
Well, certainly the case for me. Uh, the time I, the first time I went was, I think, 2007. I was invited by a colleague, a professor from Tsinghua University. So I was sort of entering at the top of the <laughs> pecking order, yeah, uh -huh. if you like, in the academic world. Right. And then I went back a couple of a uh, few more times, and it it really is extraordinary to have first-hand experience of it because it's so difficult to get a. I mean, it's just like tourism, isn't it? Really, in some ways. To, it's hard to get a, a sense of what a place is like unless you see it with your own eyes. Right, and some people say, well, you'll just be seeing government arranged um, uh, tour or something like that. Mm. Mm. Um, well, it's true that the Ch generally you would have a sponsor or a host in China, but there's also many opportunities for people just to go off on their own. For example, uh, I was with groups of urban planners and uh, before dinner and after dinner for an hour, two hours, uh, we would organize walking expeditions and walk all over the cities, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, including where people lived and shopped and, and uh, nobody restricted us from doing anything. So you, you can really, uh, it's a huge place, but you can get a wide range of experiences. One of the misconceptions I think that many people in outside of China have had is the, pro the a problem, and the misconception has created a problem that, you know, it's a it's an authoritarian situation where people can't walk around, where the notion of freedom doesn't actually exist, in the sense in which uh, it's presented by the idea of what we think of as freedom, which I'm not sure <laughs> how the two are disconnected because the vast majority of people express freedom just by going to work and doing their work and coming home again and going to the shops and so on. And that's the vast majority of experiences for people in this country, in the West, and in China as well. And yet the prevailing view is often, well, you're going to be surveilled and you're going to be threatened and you can't say this and you can't say that. Uh, I think that's probably a, li a little uh, quite misleading, isn't it? Well, yeah, I've never <coughs> experienced any restrictions on anything that I talk about or ask people about in China. Of course, you have to be... Um, tactful and considerate of their culture and so forth right. and, and not adopt, you know, an aggressive kind of accusatory um, tone. But one of our members um, has been working at the grassroots in China on environmental projects. And this is one of the uh, things that the, um, the New England chapter has done. We've uh, greatly uh, think that um, people-to-people -people cooperation, specifically on climate change, um, carbon emission reduction, things like that, mm. um, is very important because um, China and the U.S., uh, if they cooperated better on climate change and environment, that would be a big, a big plus. Yeah. And so this is an example of where we need cooperation and people-to-people um, -people, um uh, exchanges can be helpful. So this member has actually worked at the grassroots uh, in the communities mm -hmm. in China and there's a tremendous amount of initiative just among the regular people in China on on environmental issues. Right. And they organize all kinds of protests if, if there's some issue with pollution and mm. and so forth. So yeah, um, yeah it's it's uh, there's a strong central government but there's also a lot of um, activity Right. Uh, you know, among the people. And it is, it is, let's be frank, it is a different country. It is a different culture. It is not the United States of that's, America. That's the truth. Right? And, and sometimes uh, the what I think of as the imperial mind in the West especially tends to think that everything should be like us. And this has also been inverted, hasn't it, in that some, some good percentage of Chinese for a long time thought that if they came here they would be able to be that sort of transitional, in that sort of transitional group that would be more Western than Chinese. I think that's gone away now, but you know they, what I'm saying? They used to call China Gold Mountain, I believe. I used, the Chinese used to call the United States Gold Mountain, I think right? in the 19th century. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there, are, there are misconceptions on both sides, mm. yeah. Mm. yeah. What about in, in terms of the, what we think of as the collective West, in other words, outside of the United States? What's your feeling generally about maybe other countries and their notion of collegiality and friendship with China, with, with China. 
you get a sense that it's quite different compared to the United States, or is that just too broad to try and address? Well, I think the Western countries these days um, are, are, in a lot of ways, taking their cues from the United States, um, where China is identified as a, a rival, mm. uh, in a, you know, at times a dangerous rival. However, if you go into the countries of the global south, I think you'll, that you'll find a very different perspective on China. Mm -hmm. And in most of the countries of the global south, there are a lot of uh, friendly feelings towards China. Right. It seems, it seems pretty, uh, pretty clear that there's a bit of a split. And I suppose we can talk, and maybe I'll talk, ask you a little bit later about this sort of multipolarity idea, a multipolar world that is uh, somewhat different to what we have been accustomed to, but also I want to draw attention to this publication, which is part of the part of the sort of effort of the Friendship Society. Right. And it comes out what every few times a year, three or four it comes times out a year. Quarterly, four times a year. Quarterly, and it's a terrific resource if you're interested in finding out about reporting on what's happening in China. The lead article here is about the building of railways, the HSR high-speed rail, tens of thousands of kilometres of high-speed rail right. throughout China and, uh, you know, produced with a, a real, a real sort of professional sort of sense of saying, look, this is just objectively clear that these developments are taking place and they're remarkable. And uh, certainly people can see online and there are accounts, I think, on most social media now of uh, you know things happening in China on a regular basis, you can watch you can watch CGTV like the Central Chinese Television. That's an that is an excellent source for um, contemporary news from from China. Mm -hmm. CGTV. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do is I I read Western um, journalism, of course. But I also read Chinese uh, journalism. Um, you might be surprised at how different they are in reporting on the same, <laughs> the same uh, event. I'm sure. So I, I feel that the, the Western accounts are emphasize the negative. The Chinese would often emphasize the positive. Mm -hmm. Put them together, that's how I get my balance. Okay. But, but if you want to know what's going on in China, don't just read Western sources. Right. Uh, you'll mm -hmm. definitely be limited yeah. because China is not only not the United States, it's not a Western country at all. Its entire cultural, historical roots are totally different um, and, and more ancient than the, than the Western. So sure, absolutely. It's yes, a very yeah. different place, which is why one reason I find it so fascinating, because it's constantly challenging me to think differently than I'm used to. Right, wonderful, wonderful. And, and I think that's, that's entirely uh, fair that we we respect the dignity of others, right? And so respect the dignity of people who are not like us, who well, live in another part of the world. That's that's the kind of Chinese uh, key word in Chinese foreign policy: respect. All right. countries should respect others right. as equals. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I'd be interested. On, this is a bad joke, but I'd be interested in seeing them doing a, doing a version of the old you know, R E S P E C T. You know, maybe Xi Jinping could do a version of that. You know, that would be very interesting, you know, as a way of saying, look, you know, this is really fundamentally what it's about. But, you know, we, we I think, are in a culture where we, we have, we struggle, and I'm talking about Western culture as well as US culture, where we, we really struggle with the idea of respect for things that are different from us. We've had a very long run after World War II, I would suggest, of being able to say, you respect us. We're the hegemon. And that's no longer the case, is it? No. Um, uh, 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 China demands respect, of, of course, for a hundred years, uh, from the Opium War up to 1949, they were constantly um, in, invaded and mm. plundered and terrorized um, by the various colonial imperialist powers, um, and, and including Japan as well. Mm. Yeah. So, so um, China has a very long memory. Um, that's different than the United States. We tend, I think, our culture. We tend to sort of forget about what happened in the re yeah. <laughs> even in the recent past. Yeah. Uh, Chinese don't. They um, they have a 
you know, two, three, four thousand year old history, which is very continuous mm. and has uh, ancient, um, what we call ancient events have a great deal of um, um, consideration in how they think about things today. Yeah, that's, so that's remarkable. A, a big difference. Yeah, it is remarkable. That's true, and I, I, thanks for making that point. I wanted to turn to a bit more about the politics and media, particularly this question of how China is represented, or what, let's say misrepresented most of the time in the US and Western media, and how, uh, you know, this is part of a, of a larger set of questions to do with just US media coverage of China. And we could dive right in with a reference to Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman's Manufacturing Consent, a uh, famous book from what, 1988, where anti-communism is, is foundational to their model. There are several models around commercial media that's dominant in the United States. Uh, but the idea is that, the, that there's a filter on the US media. And one of these filters is that it has to be, it cannot say anything positive about communism. It has to be anti-communist. The coverage is always there. And so there's this tremendous problem in that this seems to be reproduced with China, that nothing good can be said about China because it meets the standard in the manufacturing consent model of being communist, ergo, it must be denied. It must be always negatively reported upon. And I'm wondering whether or not, you know, this is this sort of anti-communist approach is something that you recognize and, and you see as part of the challenge of how we address the whole question of China. Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I certainly agree with you on, uh, on that point. For example, um, if you take the Taiwan question, and the association um, is based upon the one uh, China principle, during World War II, um, it was agreed upon by all the allies that Japan would return Taiwan to China. It was, Japan had conquered Taiwan, I, I think it was in the 1895 or something like that. Oh, really? Um, it, that was agreed upon by all countries, um, including the U.S., um, unquestionably. Um, and at that time, China was uh, ruled by the Guomindang, which was a capitalist, uh, Western-oriented government. Right. As soon as the communist uh, forces established the People's Republic of China, um, almost um, instantly, the U.S. switched its um, uh, position on Taiwan mm. and, and said, well, no, it's actually not part of China. But I think that was simply determined by the fact that a communist government had, had uh, been established. Mm -hmm. And so that would be an example of um, anti-communism. Anti right. Yeah. I, and I think it's a good example that illustrates the long-standing opposition. But I, I would also, however, say that it's very interesting when you look at China, also the Chinese in America, that there's this kind of ambivalence. Uh, there's this kind of contradiction. It's like um, we Americans can't really quite figure out what we think about China and the Chinese mm -hmm. because you can also look at periods and where, and where the Chinese were depicted very favorably in the press. For example, during the 1930s um, mm -hmm. when um, China was resisting the Japanese invasion, um, uh, John Kai-shek, when he visited the U.S., was... Um, accorded a greeting like a hero, you know. It goes back and forth. Mm. The, the press in the 1980s was actually quite favorable on the whole towards China. But, but in recent years, it's shifted back and is now very negative, back to the negative yes. mode. Right. Of course, one of the subtexts, if you like, was not very, very low below the surface, but a subtext is the U.S. capacity to see China as a endless bank, right, a huge resource uh, for making a lot of money. And so the finance and banking industry has done very well out of China. Right. And so mm -hmm. they wanted you know, free access to this massive market. So yes. that's an important part of this narrative too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And so that there are, um, there are also business-oriented members uh, in the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of our national board members is basically a business consultant in, in terms of um, the shift towards green energy um, creates huge exchange possibilities. Um, uh, uh, China is a leader in manufacturing um, uh, green um, uh, uh, equipment such as solar panels and so forth. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has a lot of expertise and, and so that is actually another channel. Um, right. So, yeah, mm. we've, we've included some businessmen in the Friendship Association as well. Yeah, that's great. And I think it's important to recognize that within the Chinese model of socialism as it's been defined and redefined by the Communist Party of China, that there are these endlessly, almost endlessly reinvented concepts of the role of business within the development of the society and in the role of culture in, in the development of society. It's, it's actually quite complex, isn't it? And yet it's organized around a state model, which I think is a point of frustration for many people outside of China. Well, yes, it, it is quite complex. China is full of contradictions. Um, one thing that um, I think some of us in the U.S. tend to forget is, is China is actually a much bigger country than the United States. In, uh, in many geographically. measures. Geographically, population-wise, or how do you mean? Geographically, it's about the same, but population-wise, mm -hmm. it's, um, what, four times as big, something Nearly like that? Nearly four times, yeah, that's right. And it's... A lot of people. Uh, <laughs> and it's much, um, much older. Um, mm -hmm. So it's got huge cultural traditions. And so um, th uh, that's, that's an important... Um, consideration as well. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the sheer complexity and size of China is, can, can be uh, kind of awesome, I guess I would say. Yeah, sure. And, and there's, there's certainly plenty of efforts made to, uh, what do you call it, I guess cherry pick parts of China, you know, that are, that are then shown up to be a cause for opposing it. Well, that's, that's exactly how much of this negative media works, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, for for example, uh, they, they cherry pick uh, something that's not working well and, and just sort of focus on that as if it's the whole. Mm -hmm. Now take the Belt and Road Initiative um, with this huge infrastructure project. Um, there's a, approximately $1 trillion worth of uh, U.S. dollars of Chinese investment in these various infrastructure uh, projects, pr primarily in the global south. Right. Now, I, I had to estimate they're 90% successful, which is a good, mm -hmm. very good uh, percentage. But that also means there's $100 billion worth of projects that aren't working very well. That gives a lot of uh, fodder for those who want to focus in on oh, all of those problems, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a huge number of problems too. So if you highlight that part, you can make it sound like the whole yeah. the whole project is not working, but right. actually it is working. So yeah, and and you know the what it was a couple of years ago, the whole idea of doing away with extreme poverty didn't get much coverage. I think there was a PBS. TV show that was made about it that was pulled that right. wouldn't show on PBS. Oh, that's so. an excellent example. Hmm. Yeah, P and, um, in part because um, some people questioned that and they said, oh, well, this is just propaganda. So there was a lot of investigation about what is actually going on here and they actually found out that in terms of extreme poverty, that China had basically eliminated it, like 98, 99 percent. Mm, mm. um, only a few remote areas seem to be outside of, of this program. Um, and and uh, extreme poverty, what that is basically defined as, as um, uh, the basics of life. In other words, oh, if, if you're, if you're uh, worried about food or shelter, that's extreme poverty. So um, pretty much everybody in China has the basic necessities of life. 
uh -huh. um, taken care of. And of course, in the, there's still a lot of rural areas in which and um, migrant workers and life is not easy. No, no. Um, so we don't want to uh, uh, picture something too rosy. But you're right. That is kind of a historic event that was given virtually no publicity in the U.S. But you'll see that when you walk around Chinese cities, you don't you don't see homeless people or right. sick people or hungry people. Or uh, it's pretty amazing. And what what's also amazing, and I see we're coming to the end of our time. What's also amazing is just these new cities that have been built. I mean, the architecture, the engineering, the capacity to put very large numbers of people in relatively densely populated areas and provide them with all the resources is quite quite extraordinary. I mean, anybody can go and look at the photographs. Uh, of, you know, any, from, anything from the new uh, Shanghai down towards the Macau up through Beijing and other areas, it's, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it, too? Well, it certainly is. I mean, Shenzhen and, and Guangdong in the south I first visited in 1981. It was about 20,000 population. Mm -hmm. I went back and I think it was 1990. It was 10 million. <laughs> now I think it's 20 million. <laughs> so coming in, developing later than uh, many of the Western countries has enabled China to be very cutting edge in a lot of its high tech and um, architecture and so forth. And, and the U.S. government policy is really to say uh, on one hand, we're a competitor. They're competing. They're competing with the United States. And I suppose as we wind up, the the challenge will be how the competition plays out in the long long term. Wouldn't you say? Well, right. And I, I think that China sees itself as returning to its historic position as one of the leading civilizations on uh, on the planet. Mm -hmm. I think they look upon it that way more than we're competing with. United States or any particular country. Right. And, and I think that's a, a good point on which to end the idea of a, a different civilization or the civilizational argument that some people make about China, that it's a very different option for how the world can be organized and how society can be organized. And uh, thank you, Duncan, for in, enlightening us a bit and for telling us about the Friendship Society and the association, I should say, and for uh, the opportunity to perhaps he, he, for, for viewers to, to see and understand more of the interactions and uh, perhaps join the organisation. Well, thank you very much, Marcus. I've, I've enjoyed my time here. Good. Thanks, Duncan. And that's all for now. Uh, from, from me, Marcus Breen and Boston. Until next time, keep on leading.